Okay, welcome, welcome everyone in person and online to this part of Hegel lecture. Uh, this is the sixth of our lecture that we organized in order to celebrate Hegel's 20 250th birthday. But it's the first lecture that we are having in person after a long time. So I'm very happy and I think that's because on behalf of the whole group, we're very happy to be here in person again and particularly happy to welcome our speaker, Christopher Yermans from the University of Purdue. I'm going to introduce him a little quick. Christopher is a very good friend uh, of our research group in Padova, and he's professor of philosophy at the University of Purdue. As he's, a, he's a leading scholar in German idealism, working in particular in political philosophy uh, and philosophy of action, as you know. Uh, expert on Hegel in action, has published extensively on these topics, um, especially uh, I'm going to remind just two, two books, the two classics, the two books that he, uh, that he published for Oxford University Press. The one is Freedom and Reflection uh, on Hegel's Philosophy of Agency from 2011, I think it was. And then the, another one came out in 2015 uh, titled The Expansion of Autonomy. Uh, there is a third book coming out. Um, I don't know whether it's a trilogy, but it's still part of the same project. <laughs> A unitary project on the politics of German idealism, and, and Chris is going to talk about it today. Uh, and so, please join me in welcoming Christoph, and thanks for having accepted our invitation. I'll give you the word. Uh, take this off. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's great to be back here. And in fact, um, saw Luca at the last pre-COVID thing <laughs> that I did a conference at Purdue and then at the Central APA. So this is a nice, I hope, book into the, the shut-in times. I hope that they're over. So anyway, thank you very much for having me, for inviting me, for uh, waiting out COVID for me and all the rest of it. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, also, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk on a kind of big picture topic about um, what Hegel could mean for us today and so on, uh, which I think is interesting uh, to do. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm gonna try and do that. Uh, I have, uh, and uh, again, thanks for allowing me to present in English. Uh, my Italian is still not nearly good enough to present in Italian. Um, I know uh, as being a non-native speaker who goes to a lot of German talks that it's nice to have some text and I apologize I didn't have a text for you. So what I have instead are some very ugly PowerPoint slides that have a lot of text on them, which I hope will sort of substitute for them um, because I know at least for me, uh, it's always helpful to um, have something uh, to look at. Okay. Um, so the title I chose is Hegel, Our Archaic Contemporary, and I want to make something like the paradoxical claim that it is in lots of ways precisely the things in Hegel that seem to stand up to us as outmoded or old-fashioned, um, that the last five or 10 years of political life in um, Europe and the United States has shown us uh, are surprisingly relevant. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna talk first, sorry, I'm gonna do this, there we go, right? Um, about the, the sort of weird things about Hegel that I think um, sometimes, you know, we read the text, we read the text, and at a certain point it starts to feel as weird as it ought to because lots of it really is weird. And um, I want to uh, take on a couple of, uh, oh, sorry. To, I have to uh, share your screen. I forgot to screen so people from. Go away. Uh, sorry. To talk about um, the things that ought to strike us as strange in Hegel under a couple of different rubrics. Um, and essentially sort of historic rubrics and rubrics that any of you who are familiar with Reinhard Kosselek or the Bergrisch-Geschichte tradition will uh, probably recognize. So uh, the first I've sort of summarized under this uh, line that Kosselek of course takes over from Ernst Bloch, this notion of the, 
synchronicity, the asynchronous or the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous, the the gleichzeitigkeit des ungleichzeitigens, right? There's so much of this in Hegel, right? A constitutional monarchy, which even in the early 19th century seemed like a Frankenstein monster of political systems, right? A P and not P stuck together, right? A arguably in philosophy, if you don't think that Adam Smith had it, the first theory of civil society, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, and how is Bürgerliche Gesellschaft composed? Well, actually a lot like the Stende Gesellschaft that it replaced, right? It seems to be structured by the estates, the, the Stende, this old term for traditional divisions of ways of life, right? So you have simultaneously this insight into something distinctively new and a description of it as if it's something older than it is. Um, Another uh, strange thing that uh, we won't talk about much later, but uh, makes a lot of sense in the United States now. He has a legislature and a state's assembly that is legislative branch, but on his view, its job is not to legislate. Its job is not to propose legislation. It's really almost like an arm of the press, right? The job of the state's assembly in Hegel's philosophy of right is to force the bureaucrats to come explain what they're doing and ask them hard questions and to think about what they're doing. It's not actually to produce legislation, right? Since that's basically the way the US Congress works right now, at least on this view, they're doing something right. Um, I don't know whether that's uh, a point for the US Congress or against Hegel, but uh, at any rate, it's contemporary relevance. Uh, right, uh, bit. he is far more radical than Kant about the power of spirit or mind over nature and natural determinacy. And yet, at least on my reading, he's got a much stronger line about gender difference and how that ramifies in the political sphere than Kant does, right? For uh, no apparent reason, even though on the other hand, he's got a much more modern uh, conception of the family than Kant does. I've argued in, in other things that Kant has an essentially um, 17th and 18th century corporate social conception of the family, right? It's harder for us to see now. Hegel has this very modern nuclear bourgeois family where the generals are even harder, right, than they are in Kant. Right? So um, something most modern and or archaic about it. Um, similarly, there's this very empirical, right? Historical, almost sociological interest in how things are actually structured and how things actually work, right? And yet there's this commitment to a single form of comprehension, right? The idea is the structure of everything, right? So on the one hand, a commitment to display out into the particular details and how things actually work. On the other hand, an absolute confidence in one way of understanding things. Right. And then finally, this extraordinarily wide ranging historical erudition, right? Selective, <laughs> but wide ranging. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other, this apparent commitment to a kind of simplistic teleology, right? It's a, it's a weird sort of combination, I think, of uh, Hegel and Kant, right? Kant's got this teleology, but Kant's just playing at philosophy of history, right? I mean, he even says that in the conjectures, right? Ah, this isn't really serious. Like, let, let's talk about these ideas. I mean, Kant's no historian, right? Hegel's an actual historian, like Herder is. He's trying to get it right. And yet he, he seems to have this um, almost uh, like just a sort of simplistic view, right? I view. So there's all of these combinations and things. It's easy to either read out of Hegel or to stop noticing because this is the hundredth time you've read this paragraph. But I think they're there. I think they're really interesting. I think that they speak to the time in which Hegel is writing. And the basic claim that I want to make is we ought to be humbled by the last five or 10 years, 
and recognize that they speak a little bit more to our time than we'd like them to, right? Uh, and so that's why I think it, uh, I'm gonna try and make the case that uh, in his own way, Hegel is our contemporary, precisely these semi-archaic aspects that he has, right? Okay, so, uh, so much for Hegel. Um, what about the moderns, right? Um, so everybody responded to the uh, political events that I think in lots of ways started really in Italy in 2015. I think of you all as like the canaries in the coal mine, as we say in the US, as like the really, and then uh, right 2016 with the election of Donald Trump in the United States and so on. Um, and many things that have happened since then. Um, people have processed these in different ways. The way they hit me was um, to make me doubt, uh, as Bruno Latour has put it, that we have ever been modern, right? To make me doubt that we were modern in the way that um, we were, right? Um, so before I read the bit, sorry, what up? Oh. Okay, sorry. We'll get okay. to the QAnon shaman in a bit here. <laughs> um, so uh, before the Latour, let me be, be clear, right? There's two bits about this that aren't really relevant, right? Latour is interested in the ancients and the moderns, and he's interested in nature and mind. And neither of those things particularly interest me. In terms of historically, I'm much more interested in early modern and late modern, in late feudal and early capitalist, in that distinction. And I'm much more interested in the change of social organization, right? The change that often in German is rendered as the distinction between Stand and Klasse between a state and class as different ways of talking about social groups. Nonetheless, like module that kind of difference, there's a lot in this sort of classic statement from Latour that I, I think is not bad, right? He says, modern is thus doubly asymmetrical. It does a great vanquished, right? Sometimes when people talking about cultural anthropology, now they'll talk about a ratchet effect. Like you move forward and it clicks into place and won't go back anymore, right? The, the, uh, the victory is secured. So if, if so many of our contemporaries are reluctant to use this adjective today, if we qualify it with prepositions, this is written in 1991 where people were talking about postmoderns, right? Um, if we qualify with prepositions, it is because we feel less confident in our ability to maintain that double asymmetry. We can no longer point to time's irreversible arrow, nor can we award a prize to the winners. In the countless quarrels between the ancients and the moderns, or between the early moderns and the late moderns, the former come out as winners as often as the latter now. And nothing allows us to say whether revolutions finish off the old regimes or bring them to fruition. Right. A really nice way of condensing um, at least part of what I was thinking. So, I was been really thinking for a while about whether we haven't overstated our political and our social modernity, right? And there's been a bunch of different ways I've started to think about this, um, all the way back to the structural transformation of the public sphere. Habermas was talking about the feudalization of the economy. And there's been a lot of really interesting work on that, the way that worker um, groups get divided into different, um, not really classes, but almost different estates. In the United States, this happens a great deal based on immigration status, right? What you can really make use of labor laws in the United States depends heavily on what your immigration status is, right? And so on. Um, there's also all talk about the death of contracts and so on. Um, so anyway, I mean, all of this was sort of simmering um, until, you know, United States, January 6, 2020, you get this guy, right? The QAnon shaman who has just been sentenced to 40 months in prison, right? But there's so much going on here, 
right? He's, uh, you can't tell it, but he's naked to the torso with all these tattoos, right? He's got some weird like Daniel Boone, like Western Explorer furs on, right? With these um, horns. And then he's got a cheap American flag zip tied to a fake spear. Right, it's, it, it condenses something that already happened um, back after 9-11 when in the United States, we took a bunch of agencies and condensed them into something we now call the Department of Homeland Security, right? As if this country of 380 million people was a homeland, right? Like an ancestral land to anybody at all, really, right? Um, or at least the people running the government right now. Um, so, all of this I intend just as a kind of weird feud of horizons, as it were, right? A weird uh, discussion of the hermeneutical context and a suggestion that one way we can understand our current situation and some of the difficulties we're having getting a grip on it conceptually is that there's a whole bunch of the past that we thought was past that isn't really past anymore. Right. And it would behoove us, I think, as philosophers, as political philosophers, to try and think through some of this. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, right? So we talked about the synchronicity of the asynchronous, right? Um, another way that this comes out, particularly in Kosselec, is this notion that you've got different strata in society that are moving at different speeds, in different places that are moving at different speeds, that there's very uneven development, right? Um, so one of the things that goes on with this sort of rapidly different pace of change, this is older, this is from 2014, but I think it visualizes nicely the fact that in most of the United States, there's not any economic growth going on. Some places are shrinking, that's the red. Some places are growing, that's the green but for weird reasons, right? LA, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, that's tech money, right? This is real estate, Florida. This and this, fracking, right? Hydraulic uh, uh, fracturing, like oil drilling, right? Oil and natural gas, these like booms that are popping up, right? But the real estate industry and the financial industry and the fracking industry and the IT industry, they don't really have to do with each other. And, and they've, they're, they're going, they, they operate at very different paces of change, even when they're all growing, right? I mean, you can get a similar sort of thing worldwide. You see these sorts of charts, right? Where the size of something is rendered in terms of its growth rate, right? So here's the United States going to grow slowly, Mexico going to grow Right, larger is very uneven, right? Paces of change and the way that that sort of pulls things apart, right? Again, one says, I don't think I'm like telling you something new that you've never thought about before. No, but I think these are relevant to how we approach Hegel and take on Hegel, right? Okay, because one of the things I'm constantly preaching that I think we very much forget is how dramatic the political changes in Hegel's own lifetime are, right? I mean, I think the apotheosis of forgetting this is uh, in Freedom's Right at the beginning, Axel Hohne talks about how extraordinarily stable Hegel's time was as opposed to how dramatically evolutionary our own time was, is. And I think he's got it just entirely backwards, right? Hegel's living at a time where number one, Germany is just entirely conquered by France, in which there's this whole wave of what are now called the Atlantic world revolutions, right? The American revolution, the French revolution, the Haitian revolution, all of the Latin American revolutions, right? In the first quarter of the 19th century, right? Lots of far more dramatic things that are happening now. And, Right, closer to home, you go from, this is the Holy Roman Empire in, I can't remember exactly when it is, like mid 18th century or something like that, right? So this is Germany, right? The Holy Roman Empire of the German nation divided into 1800, 1,800 political entities where officially some little, 
friends here whose great, 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 great grandfather fought in the Crusades and got a title, right, is on the same level as the Austro-Hungarian Empire of Prussia, right? Like as if those referred to the same thing, right? The, you know, the, the, the famous bit, the Holy Roman Empire, that's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire of a German nation that doesn't exist, right? So, but by 1815, you get the German Confederation and you're down to 39. So from 1,800 to 39. And some of it looks the same, right? Austria, though, of course, they took over Venice, Padua, like Northern Italy by then, right? Um, but some of it looks dramatically different. And of course, I think the best place to look for this in Hegel is in his comments on the proceedings of the um, uh, States Assembly of Württemberg, where the whole line that he proceeds, uh, um, uh, um, goes after is that everything changes when Württemberg becomes a state. When it's no longer this little duchy within the Holy Roman Empire but it is itself the political entity and how the same laws and the same power relations change now that there's no empire and now that there's no external sources of influence into it, right? So Hegel is very alive to the changes in state form that are going on at his time, right? Um, so, all of that just to say, I think we can easily forget what a dramatic difference is, right? So, right, everybody knows this famous uh, letter where uh, Hegel is uh, writing and he says something like, I passed the last 30 years in this extraordinary time of upheaval and change. And I'd really just like it to slow down for a little bit, but it's not going to, right? Um, I think in lots of ways, um, the kind of change and the, how should I put it, um, conceptual level of change in the so-called saddle site or saddle period as Kosselin talks about it, of Hegel, right, 1870 to 1830 roughly, right, is even more dramatic than what we're seeing right now. So I think if you were interested in conceptual resources to understand, how traditional and modern societies interact with each other in times of ordinary change, Hegel, and I also think Kant and Fichte are places you would naturally look, I think. Not, as Honneth thinks, places that you would look for people who are just giving you their report of what traditional society is like. I don't think any of the three, Kant, Fichte, or Hegel, are doing that, right? The only like last bit of context I want to give before I, uh, oh boy, uh, before I, I see the meat of things is um, another way, uh, a way of describing what's fundamentally happening during this period is to say that you had this traditional society in which all the relations were very closely woven together, right? If you're a peasant serving on the land, your economic relations are bound up with your manorial lord. Your manorial lord has privat has private legal jurisdiction over you. So runs the courts in which you adjudicate your disputes with your neighbors. Perhaps has a role in approving who you marry or don't marry. Certainly whether you can marry in say 1770 is dependent on whether you can take over a farm or a mill or a blacksmith's operation, right? Because you don't get married unless you've got the kind of position that marriage goes with, right? And then that all starts to come apart, right? And this is an old view of what coming apart looks like, right? You get this out of Quentin Skinner, you get this out of Vanna you get this out of Kosselec, so I don't think it's terribly controversial, but I also think historians of philosophy, urban philosophy have never really picked up on it very much, right? And we should, right? Then on the one hand, you have this traditional corporate society, often rural society, 
but also the guilds in towns, right? It's worth noting what Marx notes that lots of the early industry in the 19th century actually uh, gets built up in the rural areas because then you don't have competition with the guild structure in the towns, right? So this, what a German, a German is called a Stende Gesellschaft, but then also this developing Bürgerlichkeitsgesellschaft, right? This sphere that's both the free market, but also the free press, Masonic lodges, coffee houses, reading clubs, libraries, the whole realm of voluntary associations. And then something that comes to be called the state, right? It's well, into the 18th century, actually, in Germany, before the German language really comes to any kind of stability of reference for this. The beginning of the um, uh, 18th century, the Germans are still translating the Latin status with Stand, not Stadt. They're still thinking of the state as just like the prince, and the prince has got these domain lands, and the prince also has some sort of authority, right? But they're not thinking about the state that then gets built out through the 18th century. And that just absolutely accelerates in response to the Napoleonic Wars and the need to make reparations and stand up states, right? So a lot of what I'm gonna say is just gonna be trying to pattern on it in the um, book that Luca recommend, uh, um, did, you didn't recommend it. You mentioned it, right? <laughs> you can't recommend it because you haven't read it yet because uh, it isn't out here. Uh, but in the, the book I'm trying to finish up, I read Kant, Fichte, and Hegel as essentially responding to this tearing up of these three features of social life and playing around with the different positions that you can take, right? Once it becomes clear that the traditional Stendigesellschaft perspective is different from the uh, the perspective and so on, right? Uh, all right, so for a plug, <sighs> right. So all of this put together, the basic claim that I want to make is that it's precisely the places um, where we tend to think of Hegel as our contemporary that he isn't. Lots of the things we look to Hegel for, he's not very contemporary with us. But not because we've misunderstood his text, but mainly because we've misunderstood ourselves and where we are and what we need. So I'm gonna try and make this case in five different ways. Here's five different contrasts. Um, we'll go through the logic. I'm not really gonna talk about the philosophy of nature, but I'm happy to, to, to answer questions and have Q and A about the philosophy of nature. Also won't talk much about absolute spirit, though I'm happy to talk about that kind of stuff too. But this is mainly um, political philosophy, philosophy of agency, and then I can't resist a little on the logic at the end, right? So basically, I think a lot of us think, hey, Hegel's our contemporary, among other things, he's got a theory of property, right? He's got a theory of contract. Well, that looks like classic natural law theory. We can, um, you know, slot, Hegel alongside Locke, Kant, maybe some other people is giving a theory of what property is, right? And we have property today, or let's try and figure out what the right uh, form of property is, right? I don't think that's a way in which Hegel's a contemporary of ours for a bunch of different reasons, um, which I'll talk about in a bit. But what I do think is really relevant is that Hegel actually has two different conceptions of property. So does Fichte, by the way. Um, we can talk about that later. But Hegel actually uses two different words, Eigentum and Vermögen, right? And what's interesting about Hegel is he thinks of Eigentum or property as actually an abstraction from this more concrete thing that we might own called resources or Vermögen. That I think is really interesting. And okay. Okay. Um, uh, Maybe I won't really have to convince you very much that he's not our contemporary by having a theory of constitutional monarchy. Um, but I'm ashamed to say, I think it's actually quite valuable that he's got a kind of theory of how we tend to concentrate the visibility of authority in a single person. 
and how important that comes to be in our politics. All right, so I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you know, I just came from Germany, which has had the uh, interesting experience that had Angela Merkel run, she most certainly would have won. She did not win, run and her party got killed at the polls, right? It's clear that people don't love the CDU, but they love Angela Merkel, right? And there's something about the, the way that we um, elevate individuals that I think is still really important to talk about, right? Third thing is, this is sort of a more general version of this. You might think, look, what we got at Hegel is kinds of arguments, like an argument for a legislature or an argument for a nuclear family or something like that. I by and large think that that's hopeless in Hegel now. I by and large think that most of the um, uh, particular structures that he's arguing for are solutions to very local problems under conditions that we actually don't really have anymore. But here's what I think really is useful. Um, I think what Hegel picks up from Kant <clears throat> is a bit that people like to read out of Kant, and that's this notion of the provisionality of private law, right? That property and contract and family law these are all sort of, they're valid and we make these claims, but they're not really conclusive. And they would only be conclusive if we had essentially Kant state, which is a perfect state, which is only a regulative idea, right? Talk about that more later. But I think Hegel goes with that and says, look, what's really valuable is we need these kinds of functional roles for articulating the perspectives that need to be brought into the conversation about how to make law more definite. Um, a, uh, a particular um, bit of interest to me um, that uh, uh, I think is important is, you might think of Hegel as having a theory of free will or a theory of uh, moral responsibility in particular, that's sort of one option among others. Right, like here's how he compares with Kant's radical libertarianism, right? Here's how he would slot into the contemporary way of looking at things. Um, but I think Hegel's up to something far more radical. I think Hegel has figured out that it's actually fundamentally different forms of agency and fundamentally different forms of moral responsibility that attach to different forms of life. He tried to figure that out using a sociology that we can't just like pick up today, but it's a great project and a really illuminating project, I think. All right, and then finally, you might look to Hegel as giving you a logic that give you a certain formal structures or deductive argument forms, inference tickets, as the inferentialists like to talk about it now, right? Um, I think that's hopeless. As much as I think that there's interesting stuff going on there. What I think though, Hegel's logic shows you is that perspective goes all the way down, that all judgments are incomplete and that the best you can do is coordinate judgments so that you meet the blindness of each perspective. And that I think is, is really fascinating. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through these things. Uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes, I got about 30 minutes, 20 minutes. No, no, okay. Okay, all right. I don't wanna go on for too long. Okay, so the first bit, <sighs> property and abstraction, right? Um, as you all know, no doubt, right? The three basic parts of the philosophy of right, if you put the introduction to the side, abstract right, morality, and ethical life, Siddhishkeit, right? And it's, I think, really relevant that property, I would zoom in contract, Vertrag, those appear in the abstract right. He doesn't call it natural right. He doesn't call it fundamental right. He calls it abstract right. And on my view, those are supposed to be related to this notion, I'm translating it as resources. I mean, the German is Vermögen. In lots of contexts, it's not wrong to translate Vermögen as capital. 
right? The capital that I bring into an investment, into a company, but even the way that we talk about social capital, right? The way that in, um, uh, uh, anybody with this great book, Bowling Alone, is a, uh, um, I'm blanking on uh, the name of the sociologist, but it, it traces the way Americans in particular have lost their social contacts. They don't join bowling leagues or soft leagues or um, knitting clubs. They don't have like the, the social capital, the social interactions that they used to have before. Like all of that makes sense as resources. And I really think, I've come to think that contracts are essentially replaced by corporations in this broad sense as being um, basically productive unities, right? But also including sort of local government, it's a, a rough term, right? So property and like stuff like this is replaced by my right to a job, like right to work laws, or is replaced by my right to an income, that say labor law might protect for you by preventing you from being fired for no reason, All right? Uh, side pitch for Fichte, this is basically not a Fichte. It has two notions of property, a basic notion of property, which is essentially your right to earn a living, your right to support yourself and your family through work. And that's why in Fichte's closed commercial state, if I say, that you are a blacksmith and the whole community says you're a blacksmith, we are also promising to buy our horseshoes from you so that you can make a living being a blacksmith. All right, that's the basic form of property. And then for Fichte, there's this other form called absolute property. And that's your, um, your it's like the stuff that's left over. It's like family heirlooms or your watch or, or random stuff like that. And David James is really good on this. Okay. What's the difference? Well, property and contract, they're essentially personal, right? I bought this, I hold on to this. I, um, you know, put my own photos on this and so on, right? Um, they're physical, particularly for Hegel, Property is just what the world looks like from the constructivist point of view. If you think you make the norms, the things you can own is anything that can't make a norm for itself. There's a one-step justification for property in Hegel, and it is wide, right? But it's this kind of stuff. On um, my view, and then, so it's physical stuff. Contracts are essentially bilateral in the way that we have a doctrine of the contract where there's like a meeting of the mind, like I'm gonna sell you my car and you're gonna give me money for it. And we agree on the amount of money in the car, right? And they're essentially local. The whole idea of the contract is people get together, see what they've got, and they just do it together. It's independent, right? But resources and corporations are quite different. And they're very closely tied together by Hegel in the discussion of civil society. They are essentially interpersonal. Hegel talks about resources as being your right to call on the assistance of others. Right? Not your right on interference from others, but your right to call on their assistance. They're essentially social, bilateral. A corporation is a bunch right? Like the University of Padua, right? A whole bunch of people. They're multilateral, right? Students, students, postdocs, professors, right? All got to exist in this tissue of rights and responsibilities. And in lots of ways, they're global. They're just much bigger, right? Uh, we've got uh, people on here, right, who were here in Padua, have gone all sorts of places in the world, and are still in some sense part of this wonderful research group, right? That's not like a local one-off contract, right? That's something more that's being built. So here's, um, I'm going to speed up, huh? Uh, 
here's just Hegel on the difference. I just read the first one, right? This, these are from lectures. Personal property is something immediate, but resources are not so. So this is I can do, this is from right? They are the possibility of possession. And so something lasting, right? And then here I think is the take home message. Abstract right. What it really gives you are resources in the corporations, the way they look from the civil social perspective, the way they look from the movers and shakers of the new civil society that want to make this as abstract and as negative as possible, to open up this entrepreneurial realm of free activity. Right? But what Hegel does in ethical life, particularly in discussions of inheritance, in discussions of family community property, in discussions of the states and the corporations' relations to income and property, is to say, yeah, but the traditional society and the state, they've got a stake in resources and corporations too. And they're gonna pull them in a kind of different direction. Right? And then there's always going to be a tension and a disagreement about what these resources and corporations are, because you basically got people in three different sort of social groups occupying three different sort of social perspectives, right, who are seeing different things in the same basic social norm, right? Okay. Um, I'm not a scholar of contemporary political life, so I don't even know if I have the right to show you these sorts of slides, but let me just make my pick for why I think what I just described is much closer to what we are experience right now. So uh, some of you may know this book by Greg Gilmore called The Contracts, where he basically says, look, until you get to maybe 1850, there's no general doctrine of contract in any European or American legal system that has any general applicability. That is a theory of contract that's just about the meeting of the minds and offer and acceptance. We can exchange anything that we want. Instead, you had all these different rules about rental contracts and labor contracts. And you had different kinds of rules if I was selling you a cow versus whether I was selling you barley, right? And you had different kinds of contracts for domestic contracts and international contracts. And to say that there was a doctrine of contract is misleading, right? But what Gilmore and other of us have argued is that's basically, we've gone back to that since about 1950, right? And most labor contracts are not by the doctrine of contract, they're controlled by labor laws. And most international contracts are not controlled by the doctrine of international contract, they're controlled by international commercial law. Right? Most um, product liability issues, right? If my, uh, I just bought a uh, Chevrolet electric car where it turns out the battery may explode and burn your house down, right? If I'm going to get any money from Chevrolet, it's not going to be because I have a contract with Chevrolet. It's because there's product liability and defect laws, right? So in a way, this, this thought that the economy is really these individuals like making bargains with each other is a misleading version, right? So we already talked about it. Habermas talks about the refutalization of the economy in this respect. We talk about immigration. Uh, Chris McMahon, Elizabeth Anderson have made the point that in lots of employers have a kind of political power over their employees. All right, particularly it's big, two things are very common in the United States, non-competition uh, non agreements. So if I work for a company, I can't go work for my company's competitor for a year after I leave my current job. But it's crazy. Like if you work for Subway, you can't quick and go work for Jimmy John's making sandwiches for $8 an hour. Right? They're very widespread. There's also non disclosure agreements. I right? can't say anything about what happened. There are also binding arbitration agreements where, if I have some dispute with my employer, I don't get to go to court. I have to go to an arbitration firm. And my employer pays the arbitration firm. 
and does business with the arbitration firm all the time. And I only do it this one time. It's a little bit like going to my manorial lord to complain about something he's done. And he says, well, why don't we go try it in my court? Right? So you get these mixtures of political and economic power that McMahon calls state government. Um, no, Anderson calls state government. McMahon calls it like capitalism. They're sort of mirror images of each other, right? Um, and then if you haven't read the Eric Posner and Glenn Weil book on property, I highly recommend it. It's a hilarious, fun read. Um, and they basically argue that at this point, all property is been and what capitalism requires is to get rid of property rights in Europe. Right. Um, that's a, it's a great read. Um, anyway, uh, so I think in the light of this, we should stop thinking that the most important norms about the economy are norms about property or norms about contracts. I think we need a better theory of what I call economic agents, right? Property and contract were supposed to be representations of what is valuable about being an economic agent, right? What's valuable about buying things, selling things and so on? Why should we care? Why should we protect any of it, right? Doctrines of property and contract are supposed to explain that to us. I think we need a new kind of view that it's tries to say what productive agency is like, what consumptive agency is like, what accounting agency is like. And I actually think Hegel's got a lot to, to do to point us in that direction. And I think this has got to be a theory. It isn't just the kind of civil social theory of property and contract, but is why. Okay. All right. Um, this I'll just say very quick. Um, I, I hate saying that this is a way that Hegel is relevant. I really do. It hurts me to say this, <laughs> but I do think that it's true. Um, Hegel has this view. I mean, many of you puzzled over these passages where you have to have a monarch. The monarch can be a complete idiot. The monarch is not supposed to have anything to do with really making policy. It's supposed to be the last signature, right? Why do we have to have this? Well, in the end, I think, his basic claim is this, right? That the state has to exist as thought and subjectivity certain of itself. And as a result, the truth of the, sub oh, wait, not as a result, but furthermore, the truth of subjectivity, however, is attained only in a subject and the truth of personality only in a person, right? So you've got to have this, this one person, the monarch, right? Um, background, if you're interested, uh, coming out of the 14th century uh, conflict between the papacy and um, rising national kingdoms, the notion of representation, which had really had like this private legal sense before, starts to have the public sense that we understand, where you vote for your representatives, right? And there's three sort of forms, right? First of all, um, the corporation is representative and being kind of like a person. We say Germany does that. We simply does things, right? We talk about Italy's foreign policy, right? As if it were a person. It's kind of like a person, right? So we call that Henlund's representation. Similarly, the ruler's actions are attributable to political body, right? If uh, Joe Biden signs something, that means the U.S. did something, right? But here's the most important part, as uh, for our purposes, as these uh, national kingdoms are fighting with the papacy, they are saying, look. Um, it's not, it's not like you can just see that whatever, Saxony or Prussia is a political body, right? It's really big, right? There's some valleys over here, there's some plains over there. How is this one political entity? There's nothing you can just look at. Well, except, right, to take the example of Saxony, you could look at August der Stocke, right? You can look at the prince, right? And so the ruler's continuity of the continuity of the ruler's house Right, particularly if you had a dynastic monarchy like the Habsburgs and the Bourbons, right? That ruler's continuity makes visible the political body's continuity. And theorists started to think of that as identity as representation, right? And I would love for that to have gone away, but you start to see this at American gas stations, these stickers that people will put on of Joe Biden pointing at, you probably can't tell, but 
gas is expensive in the United States now, right? Here's another crazy thing. That's 22 gallons, like 80 liters. I mean, I don't even know if they sell passenger cars in Italy with 80 liter gas tanks. Uh, it's like a, that's like a Chevy Suburban or a Ford full-size pickup or something like that, right? It's a huge thing. So, but look, the idea that Joe Biden independently controls gas prices, or even if he worked all day every day, could have that much influence on gas prices is fanciful, right? It's a long story about supply and demand and people traveling. And there's also this part about the way activist investors have forced oil companies to cut back on production uh, or uh, facilities to cut back on overhead and so on. But we still talk as if Joe Biden did that, right? Um, so again, I'd love for this to be inapplicable, but it doesn't seem to be. Okay, next thing. Um, we can talk about what he means in the Q&A, but uh, at any rate, Hegel says things like the state is an organism. That is the element of the idea into its differences, right? And among other things, what he means, in the interest of time, I won't read this, but um, is you've got the constitution in two senses, right? The German term Verfassung can be used in a way that the American term constitution really can't, English term, right? You have the actual structure of society. That's one sense of a constitution, a Verfassung. And then you have the written documents and political structure of the state. And that's another sense of the constitution. And his view in this is basically, the society produces the political constitution, which acts on the society. And there's this constant move, right? As each produces the other, right? And to my mind, the fundamental goal of Hegel's political philosophy is to encourage that kind of feedback loop, that kind of dialectic. There's a constant movement of expression where social factors are made visible in the political state in such a way that you can deal with them. And then you deal with them and that acts on the society and hopefully mitigates problems, right? Um, uh, softens power relationships and so on. And then the process repeats. To my mind, the whole structure that Hegel has is essentially transitional. It's essentially geared to keep this transition going. And he's just talking about it at one point in time, right? This is, and this is a point that I have to say um, was really emphasized by um, the mid-century German scholars like Manfred Riedel and Joachim Kretter, um, is that that whole thing is made possible because of the appearance of civil society, right? This thing that interposes itself between the family and the state, right? So that nobody can anymore think that the state is just a big Stamm, a big clan, right? A big family. Right? Hegel's adamant. If you look in the philosophy of history, we talk about Persia. In any modern state, you'll say the real advantage of them is that they're multiracial. So nobody can get the sense that this is just about one race, right? That that's a natural basis to what's going on here, right? Um, so you get this split, but the split is complicated and you've now got people who don't agree on what the norms are. So at that point, the structures that you've got are only partly representations of norms that people agree on. They are just as much a basis for a continuing conversation about what the norms ought to be. And those are the two criteria of adequacy of Hegelian political institutions, right? Okay. Um, I'll just say a bit about this because I, I realize I'm uh, running out of time. Uh, a pitch to take the notion of provisional right in Kant seriously. I don't think enough people do that. I'm entirely supportive of people like 
Elizabeth Ellis and JP Messina, who think it's fundamental, that Kant thinks actually we're always in this provision stage. I mean, you can read Hannah Arendt's views about Kant on political judgment in similar sorts of ways, I think. And that the conclusive right of the state in which the omnilateral will is actually developed as a regulative ideal um, that we can at best approach. And again, I think Hegel's extension is to say, yeah, that's exactly right. Right? And, and um, right, right, Kant's notion of provisional right is, I have a right, I have to make a rights claim, but it's indeterminate where exactly the boundary of my rights claim is. And I can't conclusively determine the boundary of my rights claim until I'm in this ideal state, which I'm never in. So I'm all in the situation of having to make rights claims that are valid but tentative, right? That is our political situation, Kant thinks, on my view and, and uh, Ellis and Messina's view. And I think Hegel takes this on board and realizes it's not enough just to have the concept of this, right? Kant thinks it's enough to, to note that and then talk about the ideal state and then hope that we approximate. I think what Hegel sees is, no, what you got to do is a sociology of the kinds of disagreements that people are actually going to have. It's not going to be random who thinks the barrier is here and who thinks it's there, right? It's always like employers are going to think it's here, workers are going to think it's there. Farmers are going to think it's here, or the state's going to think it's here, right? You could get a grip, a conceptual grip on the differences, right? Okay. Um, only to say that this kind of tentativeness was a huge feature of the legal reforms in the late 18th into the 19th century. And a particular way that this comes out that we've kind of already seen in the distinction between property and contract on the one hand, and resources and corporations on the other is the distinction between positive and negative rights. Property and contract rights are essentially negative rights, rights to non-interference. Um, uh, resources and corporations are essentially positive rights, rights to assistance, rights to intercourse, rights to engagement, right? Um, and this just comes right out of the reform periods. So this is Hardenberg who takes over uh, from Stein right around then, right? Uh, as in uh, heading up the Prussian bureaucracy from the overriding principle that national freedom must not be constrained more than necessity requires, negative natural right. Immediately follows the greatest possible production of the free use of the powers of the citizens of all classes, positive social right, right? And this then just becomes the fundamental tension between a Reichstaat, a state of rights, and a Sozialstaat, right? It's uh, what we call a social welfare state, right? That's still with us. That's really interesting. And Kant, Feit, and Hegel have put their finger right on it, I think. Okay. Um, uh, well, this is easy. I'm just telling you to read my book, and, uh, and that'll be that. Um, no. Uh, what I've argued uh, at great length with lots of uh, gory details is that in the morality section of Hegel's philosophy of right, he's not trying to build up to one right way of understanding free agency. He's trying, failing largely, but trying to show you that there are three different ways of being a free agent, each with their own advantages and disadvantages, each with their own blindness and insights, right? Each with their own satisfactions and frustrations. And it all comes from thinking that autonomy itself involves doing three very difficult things at once. What I've come to term specification of content, self-appropriation and effectiveness, all of that really means is when you're trying to act freely, number one, you're trying to do something specific, right? Of all of the options, you're trying to do this one, right? To specify what that actual content of your will is, right? Kant thought that's actually really hard to do. And it's really hard to specify to know whether that's the moral law or social inclination. That's so much able, right? 
self-appropriation. You're trying to take ownership of your action. You're trying to tell a story about how that's you. Maybe really you, right? Something like that. And then you're trying to actually make a change in the world. You're trying to be effective in the world. And sometimes you're trying to make a change in your own psychology. You're trying to reorder your drives and motivations, right? Hegel thinks like being a free agent is doing all three of these things at once, right? It's like, uh, like I don't know, you know, you got to like pat your, your head and rub your belly and I don't know, jump on your tiptoes at the same time or something like that, right? It's hard. And what Hegel thinks is basically we gravitate towards being really good at one of these and just kind of okay at the other two. And if you think that's what we basically end up doing, then that gives you sort of three different forms of life that prioritize one or the other, right? The form of life, the, the form of accountability, that is the form of agency that um, mainly worries about specifying content, Hegel describes as having the right of knowledge. Thinks of that as being very simple, it's about being clear about what's in front of you and what you want. The great thing about that is you might actually get it because it's local and it's specific. All right. The right of intention, which he thinks is all about self-appropriation. It's about telling yourself a story about a value that animates what you're doing. There's two basic values that track negative and positive rights, namely the value of Recht, or right, and the value of welfare on the other hand. Right? And then there's what he calls the right of insight into the good. And those people who just want to get stuff done be as effective as they can. Right? Well, it's not at all clear, maybe, period. But it's certainly not at all clear when you're reading the philosophy of Rome. But I think when you look at the lectures and you look at the kinds of examples that Hegel's giving, it becomes very clear that these are conceptual distinctions, but they're also sociological distinctions. And he thinks of people who are just trying to know what they want and get it. He thinks that form of agency is characteristic of the agricultural life. He thinks this story that you tell yourself about who you are and your status is characteristic of commercial production or civil society. And he thinks the drive to get things done and achieve goals, no matter what it takes, is basically the way public servants from the perspective of the state operated. So my view is essentially Hegel's giving us a pluralistic conception, deeply pluralistic conception of, of freedom, of free agency that is supposed to capture the way we thought people were actually living, right? Um, and and uh, as I said, if you want the gory details, they're all in there. Um, right. uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's just too much to, let me just say it this way. Um, I think there's a lot of Hegelians. Um, I perhaps was one at some point who wanted the social aspect of Hegel's theory of agency without having to do any sociology. We wanted the social aspect of agency without feeling like we had to come to grips with its differentiation and development. I've now come to the view that that's essentially a fool's errand. And that we've got to recognize um, that when we're doing philosophy of action, we're doing social theory at the same time. And uh, my uh, um, 
latest way of confirming this or was before it was to go to philosophy of action talks at conferences and to listen to people talk and just to sort of start to taxonomize the different perspectives they were picking up from right and it's amazing how much you can find right okay well uh, uh i promise i'm wrapping up um you might ask all right well that's interesting chris you think the pluralism about agency goes all the way down how far down do you think the pluralism goes? Well, I think it goes all the way, like all the way down, right? Uh, I think it goes all the way into the logic. I think I actually gave a talk here on mm -hmm. logical, maybe 2017 or something like that, right? So you all remember that, um, right? So look, my view is concepts or perspectives. They're ways of looking at an object. That is, there are ways of saying what's salient about an object. And Hegel thinks there are three basic kinds. You can take the universality of anything at all, the particularity of anything at all, and the individuality of anything at all as primary, and bring that into relief and know something about it. But when you do that, you're bringing one thing into relief and something else is becoming the sort of blurry background, right, of what you're seeing. Um, so I think concepts, perspectives, judgments are actually views on things, and then inferences are ways that these are all put together. Um, let's see, right? So I think I showed these before. I don't have to um, do that, right? So, well, yeah, yeah, fine, right? Uh, the inferences, right, there's a, a way of, um, talking about perspective, actually, uh, maybe I will go back. There we are, right? Um, there's a way of talking about perspective in which it's the anticipation of movement, right? It's, uh, sorry, it didn't come out very well. But the thought is, you can tell that this shoulder is above this shoulder because you feel like if you could just move back into the left, you'd see the same thing as you saw there. And you feel like you know what you would see if you went around, right? So metaphorically, I think inferences, syllogisms are that kind of movement. They're ways of moving around the object, right? And that's why they're so important to Hegel. That's why in the encyclopedia version, so many things like religion get cast out in terms of what kind of syllogism it represents, because this gives you the complete view. Um, just two more things, and I promise I'm wrapping up. Um, I think it's really important for Hegel that these conceptual perspectives are recursive. That is the same thing as input and output. You take the universal perspective on the individual. You take the particular perspective on the universal. Like that's all you've got. Right, is perspectives on other perspectives. And the only thing that keeps it from sort of running out into a house of mirrors, right? Robert Pippin loves the, the house of mirrors and the lady from Shanghai scene, right? As a, like it just runs out of the city and we never get any kind of expertise. For Hegel, the only thing that makes, prevents that from happening is that there's only three. So there's just different ways of going around in that circle. Right, ridiculous, right? Um, I do think this is Hegel's solution to a kind of problem about self consciousness, which is how are we supposed to get the subject into view? Like, I know how to get the object into view. How do I get the subject into view? I think Hegel thinks the subject is plural. So we get our subjectivity into view by seeing it from these different perspectives, which is by seeing our subjective perspectives from different perspectives. So it goes all the way down, okay. Um, uh, I won't go through these examples, um, but I think it's really, really mm -hmm. valuable. And I think particularly from the perspective of Anglophone philosophy, that to my mind is more in search of a single stable, eternal God's eye point of view than ever and is thus more socially and politically irrelevant than it's been in my lifetime in the United States. Um, coming back to this kind of pluralism um, uh, connected to the logic, among other things, would be really valuable.
Right. So in conclusion, the, the Hegel offered to you <laughs> as our archaic contemporary is somebody who's got a conception of a logical perspective that connects to a, uh, um, a conception of social pluralism that is supposed to help us articulate this provisionality of all of our legal and political norms in a way that can help us get a grip on the transitions that are continuing. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for this. Well, that is a camera. I thought. Oh, I think it, I think of it as like how <laughs> two thousand one. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris, for the rich, oh, thank you. Sorry, went on overarching, insightful, and provocative talk. Uh, I think we can just open the discussion and the Q and A. Yes, sir. I believe I have. So. By talking, so there is a lot of stuff that we can discuss. So, please, uh, if you also for the people that are online, if you want to sign up for questions, just please like uh, write it in the chat and I give you the word. Stop. Okay, questions? Lorenzo? Yeah. Can I take the last one? Yeah, I think so. So, um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have to think about all you said because it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but I was, I was struck by you saying that, by you pointing out that we have in Hegel a legislature that does not make laws, it doesn't, it's not legislative. Right. But, for me, the real point is that it's not that it does not make laws, but that it's not a, le a legislative power in the sense that we currently understand this concept, right? because it's not a representative power in the sense that we understand it. It does not represent the people's will. It, it, it's, it's not a sovereign power. So I was wondering if you think that at least in, in the United States nowadays, you are facing a crisis of the concept of legislative power. I would say um, we are facing a crisis in the concept of representation, of which is one thing that you, uh, and I would say that um, we have lost a solid sense of what that could mean. So you're entirely right to, to put your finger on another feature of the estates assembly that looks tremendously archaic for us. It looks like um, the distinction between the House of Lords and the House of Commons in the UK is if anybody cares about Lords anymore, right? Um, for those of you who aren't up on this before, Hegel has a bicameral legislature, a bicameral estates assembly with lower house composed Interestingly, he sometimes says not of representatives from the agricultural estate, but just from the agricultural estate, as if every farmer is going to be there somehow, right? Um, uh, and then an upper house, which is composed of representatives or deputies from civil society. And um, the further point about civil society, at least from civil society, is that the voting for those deputies runs through the corporations, right? So if, uh, um, I don't know, uh, uh, for some reason, I, I can't think of what a, we'll do a modern industry. If I'm a steel worker, I vote for a representative who is going to be a representative of the steel working community rather than to be a representative of, um, I don't know, Cleveland, Ohio, or Gary, Indiana. So, you know, pick whatever steel town, right, is relevant. So, right, so there's a weird sense of representation there, right? Um, right, that's very different from 
our sense of representation, which is, I think, has ambivalence to it. Some ways it's geographical, and it's different places, different ways in different political systems. The United States, I would say, on one hand, we think we're individually represented because I vote as an individual. On the other hand, I vote in areas of widening geographical area, right? So I live in a college town. The state representative for our college town is always going to be a Democrat. The US House of Representatives representative is from this broader area that includes a bunch of farmland in addition to Purdue. That representative is always going to be a Republican. Somehow I'm supposed to be represented by these two people who have diametrically opposed views, right? Um, maybe it's different in places where you have a parliamentary system and so on, but in any event, right? There's a problem of representation. Um, Hegel, I, I think, for, so, well, one more thing to say about this, right? In terms of the um, conceptual history of it is since the 1815 Bundesakte that, sets out the, um, the Deutsche Bund, the German Confederation, which had an article in it that said, all member states are to give their people a constitution. There was a debate about what that constitution had to look like. And part of the debate was on the question of representation and whether that representation would be landstandish, sort of like corporate representation or individual. Right? And Hegel, like Montesquieu, opts for this standish sort of representation, right? So on the one hand, I agree. That looks very different from modern legislatures. Um, on the other hand, two things give me pause. <laughs> Number one, everything that Hegel says is wrong about individual representation. He's entirely right about it, right? Which is, it's to demagoguery, it's subject to the influence of money and manipulation, right? Um, I mean, who doesn't think that, right? Now, now, that's still the least worst option, right? Maybe it's still the best. Um, but the other thing is, at least in the United States, we're starting to have a much broader conversation about representation, including cultural representation, right? The um, amount of... I think maybe it's, I don't know what to say about it, but the, the amount of time and energy that goes into parsing representation of race and gender and in Marvel movies is kind of extraordinary. Um, but everybody sees these movies, right? So I think I think it does matter, right? It's a bit like um, you know, you can like Star Wars or not like Star Wars, but it is, and everybody's seen it. It kind of doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Like I hate Marvel movies, but but my view doesn't matter. Right, everybody sees them. So anyway, the other thing I would say is a broader sense of cultural representation, and um, and that bleeds into political representation, where people worry about the um, lack of representation of Black Americans in particular, right, in politics. Um, and I don't say that I endorse Hegel's view on this, but I now see it as a meaningful suggestion to think, look, there are these social groups, right? I think Hegel would say to us Americans, race is not going away. It is how your society is structured. So you ought to think about building in some sort of quota representation, right? It's not the craziest idea in the world anymore. So yeah, here's the only other thing I say, and this is one that you can push more. Um, the thing that I think Hegel does get right, that's valuable for us, that, that our modern legislatures do do a good job at, is the publicity, right? That they do really do bring things to public awareness. But the question is, from what perspective do they raise questions? And if you don't have broad social representation in your legislature for the raising of questions, um, you don't really get the kind of publicity that, that you would like to get. So anyway, uh, it's a long-winded answer that maybe mud things, but um, but I do uh, I do essentially agree. His view is archaic for this reason as well, um, but not as crazy as I used to think. Um,
Thanks. <laughs> okay, I have another question from Julia. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And um, my question is a um, methodological question, yeah. uh, uh, an provocation, maybe. Yeah. And, um, we have seen that uh, there are many categories uh, that we share with data to um, our present, our political present. But since Hegel um, teaches us that uh, the society uh, undergoes a uh, constant change, uh, maybe we should think that they are not the these categories, are not the most characteristic and the innovative of our presence, uh, but they are those that we are, we are going to rethink because they are um, already. And uh, it comes to mind, for example, uh, the state uh, yeah. uh, that uh, today we have a problem uh, to think the uh, sovereignty of the state. Yes. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Um, I have um, here's maybe my way of grappling with the methodological problem you suggest, um, and um, uh, sort of comes out of my previous response as well. Uh, the question is at what conceptual level can Hegel be helpful to us, right? Where are the resources that help us? And I suspect that it's right what I took you to be suggesting, that as the pace of change increases, you might think that the essentially low level concept, like I take the concept of the state or the family to be as kind of low level local concept for Hegel, as opposed to something like the idea or, or the concept that's way up high, right? Um, that those are going to be, um, if you like in the metaphor, the gears that turn most quickly, right? And, and I'm particularly the example that you uh, suggest the state. I think that's one that we should definitely rethink, right? I think the notion of the state serves a kind of function like the notion of property does. It's a kind of familiar crutch um, that obscures more than it illuminates, right? Um, then the question is sort of how far back up do we want to go, right? In the same way that like, look, if we're talking about a legislature, please do not take me to be suggesting that we should reorganize the United States Congress so that the House of Representatives is all farmers and the Senate is all merchants, right? That, that's not what I'm saying, right? But, um, you know, I am, Maybe here's an intermediate place where I would say um, the distinction between Stand forms of social organization and class of forms of social organization, between state organization and class organization, that that distinction and the thought that um, in different times, different part, different aspects that they might be intentioned in different ways. That I find really valuable. So, I mean, I often in these talks, and maybe I've shared this before, um, share a quote from Max Weber, where he says, look, it's actually the difference between Stand and Klasse, it's all about pace of change. When economic change is fast, then the kinds of cultural identifications and modes of shared interests that Stand represents fade in the background and the class position of workers, shopkeepers, large employers becomes more important. But when things slow down again, those class positions recede into the background 
and the shunned organization and the kinds of emotional investments that people have in, like in the United States saying, Merry Christmas, right? In the grocery store, it's like a big issue in the United States now, right? Um, those come to the fore again. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that sort of notion, all right? And if you combine it with the, the Koselekian um, recognition that it's pace of change is not society is one thing like a billiard ball and it's either moving fast or slow, right? Some parts of society are moving very fast and some parts are moving very slow. And there's this tension there, right? To my mind, what is supposed to be representative about the estate's assembly is that the agricultural estate is supposed to be inertial. It's supposed to be conservative in the temporal sense. And the estate of civil society is supposed to be accelerationist, right? It's supposed to be progressive again in the temporal sense, not so much. So maybe all of this is just a report to say that I think you have to take that question on a case by case basis. Um, and the details matter. So I would say, and maybe this is a, I could add this to my list of things of where Hegel's not our contemporary and where he is. <laughs> I don't think Hegel's notion of the state has much to say to us right now. I, I'll, I'll really scandalize you. I think Fichte's notion of even the closed commercial state might have more to say to us than Hegel's notion of the state. Because at least Fichte sees how international currency trading and finance is directly contrary to the sovereignty of the state. Hegel, Hegel doesn't see that, Hegel doesn't get that, right? Um, I mean, again, please do not take me to be advocating fixed a solution for that, which is close all the borders, maintain a subsistence economy, don't grow population, all right? That's not a good idea, right? But in any event, I would say the state is one place where Hegel's not actually our contemporary, but, the distinction between traditional and corporate or stand and class organization is one where it is, right? And you can see things like the importance of the urban-rural divide in contemporary politics. I, mean, I don't know what it's like in Italy, but that's a huge important divide in the United States right now. Um, even though farmers in the United States are by and large, they raise commercial crops on farms that are thousands and thousands of acres with millions of dollars of huge combines to make corn syrup and soybean powder for dog food and things like that, right? So anyway, I don't know. it's a long answer to your question, but I do take the methodological problem very seriously. I just also think it has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it is always uh, interesting to hear you. Um, I, I have a question about the notion of state as an organism. Yes. Um, uh, the first point is that when, when we think uh, of state as an organism, uh, yes. uh, it is not an organism in a substantial sense, but uh, I think you are right when you say that it is an organism in functional sense. Yes, it agree. is an organization of functions. But my question has to do with uh, our contemporaneity and with our days. Yes. Um, there are a lot of authors that uh, think that uh, the, the, the nowadays, nowadays um, populism yeah. is a sort of nostalgia yes. of a, an organistic yes. state, of a, of a state as an organism. Yes. Um, for example, there are people who think that the notion of uh, um, folk is the notion yes. of, uh, of uh, notion of folk is uh, the idea of uh, a, an organistic unity yes. and so on. Yes. And I think that there are two possible readings of, of this problem. Um, some people think that uh, uh, this nostalgia um, 
is the nostalgia for a pre-modern yeah. state, for a state that come um, before the liberal state. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are other people, and I am with these people, that think that uh, this nostalgia is perhaps a pathology yes. of the modern state and of the liberal state, yes. that it is no more uh, capable to think the organization, this uh, uh, functional unity yes. of the state. And so uh, organicism, in, in a sense, uh, uh, in, in a giving sense, uh, is not uh, the idea of a pre-modern, yes. of a liberal state, but it is the attempt to think uh, beyond the pathologies of the modern state. Yeah. This is my reading, but yes. I wanted to, to think, I to, to know what you think. Yes, no, I'm entirely sympathetic. I mean, one of the things that reading Kosselek and other historians has um, absolutely disabused me of is this notion that the early modern or late feudal state was organic in any meaningful sense. There is in fact more conflict between peasants and manorial lords and between the nobility and the princes in, uh, I don't know, like uh, pick some dates, in 1800 than in 1900, right? And, um, uh, and, and so it's not a golden age, right? That we have some sort of cultural memory of that we're longing for, right? But it does become a kind of pathology of liberal order where the very um, provisionality is the way I would think of it. The very provisionality of modern legal systems where everything's constantly under discussion um, looks to people like a failure, right? Whereas I think Hegel thinks, no, that's the success, right? Um, and so I'm very sympathetic to this. And it, for what it's worth, I think this is Hegel's view about, for example, <laughs> religious fundamentalism, mm -hmm. right? In the discussion of faith and enlightenment. I think this is based, like, like um, what we would, what we think of in, in the American sense as evangelical Christianity, right? Um, the, what then were main, what are now mainline Protestant denominations for Hegel, Methodists, Presbyterians, he thinks of not as a return to an earlier form of Christianity, if they wanted that, they become Catholics, right? No, it's actually an Enlightenment response to the Enlightenment. It's a modern response to modernity. And I very much think that that's the case, right? And um, now, uh, oh, sorry, did I screw something up? Okay. Um, uh, now, it's complicated because I do think, at least in the American case, I would say, um, there are, particularly in rural areas, people who within a generation have seen a kind of decline in community that really is real, right? So in the United States, we talk about deaths of despair now, right? Particularly in rural areas, opioid addiction is very high, suicide rates are very high and so on. Right. Um, and these are places where you had functioning small towns 40 years ago and you just don't anymore. You just have old people and unemployed people. That, in a way, it's not really nostalgia because they lived through it, right? In a, in, in a way. And it was in some ways good, right? Um, but that easily is made into an ideology and particularly a racial ideology by the Steve, um, Steve Millers and Bannons of the world, right? By people like Trump, by people like Orban in Hungary and so on. And so, I mean, I, I think 
at least as I see these, it's the, the sort of um, the old line that the most convincing lie has a truth buried in it, right? There is this truth in the United States about what happened in rural communities. Donald Trump is not going to make them better. Protectionism is not going to make them better. Rural communities were not always white. It took a lot of terror to make rural communities white in the United States. They were very multi-ethnic, right? Well through the Civil War, well through the 19th century. It took the Ku Klux Klan to make it mono-ethnic and white, right? Um, so at least I find in the US politics, I try and keep those strands separate because, um, because there is a kernel of truth, these, these communities that have, have collapsed, but then it gets translated into this absolute ideology. And, but I mean, maybe further you would say, um, why did these places collapse? Well, because of capitalism. Right, they collapsed because instead of having a fam farm in the United States that was 200 acres, now an economically viable farm has to be 5,000 acres. And that means there's that many fewer people with farm jobs and nobody needs to take in the harvest because you have a giant John Deere combine that mechanizes everything, right? To produce your commodity crops and so on, right? It wasn't um, immigrants didn't take those jobs, right? John Deere tractors took those jobs. Yeah. So yeah, and now I'm very sympathetic. Yeah. Okay, three people on the list. So I, I am the first one actually. So I'm, and then there is Mantia and Julia. Okay. Um, oh. And Pablo, so? okay. Okay, so I, I try to keep it even shorter. I talked for a long time, so you should grill me for a long time. So my question is, I, it's very, very general about the, the, the kind of process based yes. on your talk and then on some of the materials and the introduction and the sentence. Yes. Uh, and the, the question is the following up. So you, you put the focus on of, of your like interest in Nagel in the notion of civil society and the way civil society emerges right. in the history of modernity as something right. separate from the state. Uh, and then you think you seem to think that that helps us to understand a lot of things like having this notion of civil society. So I was wondering what would your reply be to an old-fashioned Marxist <laughs> that tells you, no, no, no. <laughs> All these phenomena are perfectly understandable in terms of basic economic structure. Yeah. And civil society has much more to do. So it's, it's much less autonomous than you think, uh, autonomous from yes. those economic structure. And the very, and when you were talking uh, today, you had this like all these phenomena that you were listening yes. to, contracts, reorganization of economy, right, right. state government, properties, monopoly, all these phenomena. Yeah. I mean, an old Marxist say, well, why are you disturbing civil society? All this right. is perfectly understandable in terms of basic economic structure. And even some aspects of civil society are understandable. Then. Yes. So that's what, 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 what do we get more thanks to your approach? There was a very yeah. uh, question. And, and, I had another little point about the whole project that I found super interesting. It's oh yeah, in terms of it's the power of understanding things. That it's a diagnostic test. Yeah, that's very, very yeah. useful. Yeah, you don't. I mean, you put aside. You don't talk much about normative aspects. Yeah. So uh, that is present in yeah. in Hegel. So right. Uh, so it's a, it's a good, good reconstruction of, or way of understanding yeah. this descriptive test, but not having that normal aspect. So never, not having view of things should work in a good, good set, like yeah. how civil society, if you want, can work. Yeah. Prevents you to diagnosticize or social pathology. You don't talk about social pathologies. Can you talk right. about this? social pathologies yeah. or not? That was the question, the second question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, great. Uh, let me just, I'll, I'll, I'll take it in reverse order. So 
Um, I think I said something like every institution in Hegel is simultaneously supposed to be uh, what you might call it, an articulation of provisional right, or if we wanted to use your terms, provisional normativity, and a basis for resolving disputes about that normativity. I think I probably talked more about that second part than the first part. Because maybe the first part's sort of more obvious. I don't know. But um, so uh, you know, well, take the family, for example, to take a, a, a simple uh, institution. It's on the one hand, right, right? Hegel sets out a certain understanding of what the family is, how to understand certain kinds of rights, right? Uh, in the broadest sense of the term. So not just as it were, rights of spouses against each other, rights of children against spouses and so on. Though he does think that there's a, a, an in that there's an internal legal structure to the family, right? Um, on the other hand, he thinks the whole value, well, one of the, several whole values of the family. He, he specifically denies that the, that the family has a health spec as a single fundamental aim, right? Which is already an interesting move, right? What he says is, um, look, the family has this value for at least two different reasons. Number one, because it's a way, it's a place in which your particularity can be um, acknowledged as particularity. This is what love is. Right, um, my my wife and I have to love all of our funny little flaws. Right, my colleagues do not have to think my flaws are funny. Right, they do not have to love me for my flaws. Right, um, uh, there's supposed to be a kind of love and connection that the family enables, and that gives it its substantial value. Um, so that the, the the notion that it's precisely about being bound so close together is at odds with the fact that there's an internal legal structure. It's also at odds with the fact that the Hegel thinks the whole, well, I keep saying the whole point, that one of the points of the family is to dissolve itself, which it essentially does by educating its children so they can go out and be independent members in civil society, right? And so in so many places where Hegel's talking about divorce law, where Hegel's talking about um, arranged marriages, where Hegel is talking about inheritance and community property within the marriage and so on. You see him engaging in this kind of balancing act that like, look, here's an institution that is totally overburdened with significance and function, right? Um, it, it's, it's a way, uh, in fact, uh, Lucas, question about functionalism. It's like the family is hyper-functional. <laughs> it, it has so many different functions and they're pulling it in so many different directions that what you're trying to find is this sort of balance, particularly if you look at Hegel's stuff on inheritance law. I think it's really that way. Um, and so there is supposed to be a normativity there, I think, right? So for example, Hegel, like one of the balances that he strikes is he thinks, uh, look, like some people sometimes this just don't work. Divorce has to be legal, but you really got to make people think about it first. So they got to like talk to a judge or a priest or something like that, right? That's supposed to be this sort of balance, right? Or same thing with sort of inheritance. And I take those balances to be ways of um, talking about normativity that's kind of provisional, right? Like at this stage of things, and remember, particularly when you're talking about inheritance, Hegel's living in a time in which almost the only thing that was worth owning was land, All right? There's almost nothing else worth owning. Um, so when he's talking about primogeniture, when he's talking about inheritance, um, he's trying to balance these forms of normativity. So that's where I see the real normativity coming out in, in Hegel trying to strike these balancing acts, right? I mean, I think I could actually tell a similar story about representation of the estate's assembly. Right, um, but look, like in the estate's assembly, the groups are different now. Families are different now. 
the balance of functions and the balance of normativity has got to be different. But I do think Hegel thinks if you can be explicit about the fact that an institution subserves multiple functions, fulfills multiple function, functional roles, you've brought to visibility the problem of provisionality. Now you can have a conversation about it, right? Um, so that's where I think the normativity is. Um, why not Marx, right? Um, well, I actually think if you want to complete this story about where civil society is, Marx is crucial. But what's worth, I actually think Deleuze is crucial too. Because what Deleuze gets that Marx didn't really yet see, because it hasn't maybe developed to the level of finance capital and the role that that plays politically. Um, and I mean, look, we, I think we tend to overstate how industrialized Germany was in Hegel's time when the God's on the wasn't industrialized at all. Right, um, you don't really get that until later in the 19th century. So it's not as if Hegel's looking at industrialization and thinks, oh, that's just not important, right? He, he's sort of seeing what's happening in England and he's trying to process these things and he's worried about poverty, but it's not really there, right? Marx tells you about industrialization, Deleuze tells you about finance capital. Um, but Marx overstates, I think, the role that class and that the economic base can play. So in the end, I just think the base superstructure model is wrong. It gives you bad historical explanations. Um, and I think that the subsequent history has just showed us that class society did not replace Stein society. It just, um, added a different form of sort of organization alongside Stein society and that they're interwoven in that way. So if I were to um, talk to you about another book that I'm trying to call The Critical Theory of Economic Agency, in which I try and do what I was promising here to say, this is what matters about economic agency. Then you'd hear me talk a lot about, as much about Kant and Deleuze as about Hegel. Um, but I think um, Marx, I find as much a symptom of this liberal period between 1850 and 1950, when there's such rapid economic change and it looks like class is the only important thing. And I just think now when we look back at it, we can see that that was a unique window and it isn't actually the key to understanding everything. Right. It gives you another analytical category that you can't get rid of, right? Class organization, relations of production, right? And the way property is a form of relation of production and so on. Um, but I just don't see that it can all be the, it all be the whole story, I guess is what I think. Um, but to tell the whole story now, to say what this triangular field of tension between civil society, corporate society, and this looks like. You need a much more developed sense of what civil society is than Hegel has, right? I'll say one more thing about this because I know it's been long winded. One of the things that Habermas and the Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere points out is it's later into the 19th century before it's clear that civil society and the public sphere are really in the economy and the market and not. Masonic lodges and reading groups and newspapers, right? Um, that's what Marx see and Hegel's at this earlier stage in civil society. Yeah, sorry, that's what I'd say. I'll try and be shorter. Um, okay, I have Julia Battistoni from the <laughs> Julia, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Chris. Hey, I Julia, how are you? Hi. <laughs> so thank you very much for your wonderful talk. And uh, well, I have a question about your interpretation of Hegel's theory of, of action as a pluralistic conception of free agency, because, or better, I, 
I just would like you to go a little bit more into depth in what you said about the possible correspondence between the three uh, rights of the subjective will developed in the morality chapter of the philosophy of right and the agricultural life, the commercial production and the public service because so you said that you, uh, you could find examples of that in the lectures. And I'm very curious because I never understood the thing in this way. And a, a, a follow-up question would be, um, if we accept this interpretation, don't we run the risk of uh, understanding the three kinds of accountability as mutually um, excluding each other? Because I think that uh, it wouldn't be a Hegel's idea. So thank you very much. Right, yeah, yeah, no, you put your finger right on the problem. Yes, absolutely, we run the risk. And absolutely, that is a view that should be avoided, right? The, um, uh, as I sometimes put it, the problem with any liberalism is that, if, that you might have to count too high. And as it were, you might just have a bunch of things <laughs> side by side, right? So if you have three forms of something, maybe you can try and see them as three forms of the same thing, right? But if you have a thousand plateaus, who knows how they're related to each other, right? You can write a book where you only talk about 10 of them or 15 of them or something like that. So it's absolutely crucial that they not come apart and be completely separate. And they're, it's crucial for Hegel because I think this is all part of an argument to show his contemporaries, that even though it looks like the agricultural life and the commercial life and the bureaucratic life are totally different, and we're going to have to choose one of them as what counts as the paradigm, as what counts as real freedom, maybe what counts as being a real Prussian, right? that instead we can see the three as versions of the same kind of freedom. So the key for me is to say the following, and I realize this is a very fine line to, to walk. The key is to say there's no successful agency without doing all three of those things at once. Determining the content of your will, appropriating your action to yourself and being effectiveness. If you, as it were, score an absolute zero on one of those things, you haven't done anything at all. You haven't even done the other things. On the other hand, it's not as if they can sort of be jointly maximized like a mathematical problem, right? It's instead like you can try and do really well at one and sort of okay at the others. So the thought is supposed to be, I think, that if, uh, if Hegel could, could get through to the average um, farmer and the average merchant and the average um, civil servant, he would be able to say to them, well, so here's an example, right? Um, lots of the discussions that he has are about the difference between the agricultural life and the commercial life. And he'll say, he'll talk about the rootlessness of the commercial life the insatiability of the commercial life, right? The way it's never enough if you're in business, right? You never give, get what you want and you're just stockpiling money and so on, right? And uh, some of the early uh, uh, Yena documents, he says, it's as if Gelatin and Haben were the same thing. As if counting for something and having things meant the same thing, right? As opposed to, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the farmer who he says, um, uh, uh, oh, what's the line? It's something like, um, uh, de, der Genust is uh, Vergnügens genießt, or something like that, right? It's like, uh, like in, in relish the enjoyment of pleasure or something like that, right? I mean, it's a, he thinks there's a kind of immediate satisfaction to the agricultural life. And here's what I think he thinks, if he thinks, you know, uh, if you're telling this as a joke, right? And the farmer and the merchant walk into the bar and Hegel's the bartender, right? Hegel tries to convince them, hey, I know you guys don't really like each other. I know you think you're doing completely different things, but you, the merchant, like, you've got a specific goal and you're trying to reach it. 
And it's frustrating that you can never be sure. Can't you see how valuable it is that this farmer is happy with what they've got, right? At the same time that you can say to the farmer, look, you're trying to tell a story about why you're a good person, why these things that you did are reflective of your character. Like, can't you appreciate that this, um, this merchant has got a really well-developed story of how that's the case, right? I think that's the way that it's supposed to work. So, I mean, sometimes I think of it as in terms of the perspectives, right? Or um, actually the first time I met you in Valencia, I gave that paper on Hegel's comedy of action. And it's supposed to be, I think Hegel thinks funny that everybody is blind and is really good at some parts of agency and really bad at others. So if they could come to see that other people were good at those things that they were bad, at, that they would kind of recognize that they've got common cause to work together. That's the way it's supposed to work, but man, <coughs> and this gets back to the Marx question too, right? Look, it, that, that's fine if you got, only have to count to three. Right? What if there's 20 social groups? Can you pull the same trick? I don't know. Hegel can barely make it comprehensible for three. Right? M maybe that's lost. I don't know. That that keeps me up at night. Thank you. Okay. The next question, from Matia. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Mm, I have a question about the, the notion of perspectivism. Yes. Um, social uh, pluralism and logical perspectivism about the, the, the function of the state. Oh, all right. Uh, we talk about this uh, relationship between corporate society, civil society, and state, no? Yeah. But I, I, I just have a question. Uh, don't we have the risk in the way to lose like the, the universal, the immanent, the ethical goal, purpose of Hegel's philosophy in this way? So I mean, the only way to, to, to have an ethical life in Hegel view is like to try to, to universalize this particular yes. interest it's in the, the role of this function is the state. Yes. The state is not something <coughs> not a mere perspective, but maybe it's something more than a perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. In this way, can we like try not to, to, to distinguish the, in this strictly way, the civil society state, but can we try to, to, how to say, to identify the link between the civil society, the immanent internal yes. link in the civil society and state? So yes. if it's, it's something more, something else, and not something just opposite. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, maybe it's a question. question sorry. No, 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 it's a, it's a good question, and it's, um, I'll wave my hands at even further complicated. In a way, the problem is even worse than you make it out to be. Um, the, because the problem is, if I'm right, that Hegel thinks there's just three fundamental perspectives, and none of them are any more fundamental than the other. That means even the sense of how they hang together has to take three different forms because you can only take it up from one of those three perspectives. And things get really complicated in a hurry. Um, and I have tried to write this stuff out and it is at the absolute limit of my abilities and I have produced texts that uh, I'm not sure are comprehensible. Um, but it's an attempt to deal with precisely this problem and this risk. Um, I do think, number one, that Hegel is self-conscious enough to say, hey, look at me, I'm a self-servant writing from the universal perspective. That's what you're gonna get from me, right? That there's a, um, a humility is the word used in uh, relation to Hegel, but um, there is a recognition, a self-awareness or something like that. Right. Um, but it also has to be a case, like Julie was saying, about the, um, the forms of agency that they don't just come apart. And one of the um, few negative remarks that Hegel makes about Montesquieu, to whom otherwise I think Hegel is very close, um, is on the doctrine of separation of powers, where Hegel says, yeah, you don't want everything concentrated, but you don't want them fighting each other either. Right? 
which to be perfectly honest, Montesquieu actually does. Montesquieu wants the aristocracy to fight the crown, right? He, he wants them to be sand in the gears to slow things down. That generates mod moderate government as Montesquieu is concerned. But Engels says, no, they've got to be interlocked in precisely the way that you're suggesting. So how does that work? Well, I think that there's a lot of transitions. So for example, um, just to, to pick up on the transition that you mentioned between civil society and the state. This is all the talk about the corporations being a kind of local universal, right? Like Montesquieu, and this goes to the representation point, Hegel thinks most people cannot go from their own immediate context and experience to the common good of the state as a whole. And it's not because they're bad people. It's because that's really complicated. And you have to know a lot to try and figure that out, right? Most people just can't do it. Um, but people can go part ways, right? A steel worker has got some pretty good ideas about how the steel industry might be improved, right? And if you got a steel workers union, that worked with steel workers management, they could come to some common cause about what workers need and what management needs and what the, the competition is like and so on. And so I think Hegel's idea is that you can sort of layer up from that, right? And so what you really wanna do if you're voting is vote for somebody who's also a steel worker because you know what those people are like and you know, that guy's not to be trusted, but you know she knows what she's doing, right? Um, I think that's part of Hegel's idea. But the corporations are supposed to be, and this this is very close. Well, no, it's not close, but it's uh, analogous to things that McMahon and Anderson are saying about the political status or the political function of corporations in economic life is. Corporations for Hegel are supposed to be local forms of political interaction. And so that's why they include not only economic corporations, but local governments on the Prussian model where you had autonomous local governments, right? It's supposed to be, there's a, um, right, a, a famous Norman Rockwell painting, right? You know, the American painter, Norman Rockwell, early 20th century, he painted these like scenes of like good old American life, right? Uh, but one of them is this um, obvious like poor farmer standing up at the town hall meeting to say something, right? This is like the image that Hegel has. It's like, that guy is not going to Berlin and convincing the bureaucrats there what they ought to do. But he might stand up in a local group of people that he more or less knows and speak his mind. Right, and so Hegel thinks of the corporations as being ways that we educate ourselves, forms of political education, right? So this sort of gets back to Lucas' question. They, they have a form of normativity in and of themselves. If I'm a member of the corporation, the corporation has to train me. I have to train other members of the corporation. We have to help each other out. But also it is a, a form of uh, political bildung right, um, where people come to be more integrated into that conversation, I think, right? Similarly, I think Hegel thinks, um, part of the weird thing about education is it's a deeply family matter that is designed to liberate people from the family, right? I mean, he talks about the ethical dissolution of the family in civil society. And I think that's supposed to be a place at which the, um, the, uh, the great um, uh, substantial bonds of the family are brought into contact with the loosening of those bonds, right? But I mean, look, here's what I think, that Hegel himself thinks that might work in 1820. I don't think he has any commitment to thinking that would work in 1920 or 2020. I don't, I don't think he's trying to think that far off ahead. Yeah, thanks. The next question by Sasha. Oh, pardon. Oh, pardon. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very um, much for your presentation. Well, I got a small question um, on, constant, on the concept of person. Yes. Or something. Yeah. And from your final sentence, subject is plural. Yes. I think that's right. Uh, I would like to extend this confusion. Yes. Uh, uh, you say at the same time that person, this character mask, this person, is plural as well. Uh, uh, that is, it's not only synonym of local bilateral, but as well a social relation. Yes. Uh, or, for example, at least bilateral. Or, yeah. So, I think, well, the only possibility to think person is as plural as well. Yeah. In, the, in this way. Uh, because, well, in relation with uh, another person, yeah, another representation in this sense. Uh, yeah. The same. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think um, you can see it in the text in one way, or at least one way, which is the following. Um, Hegel has a narrow and a broad sense of the use of, you, narrow and broad sense of the term person. In the narrow sense, it means what Roman law made people out to be, that is, bearers of property rights. And sometimes Hegel will use the term in that very limited way. Sometimes he uses it more broadly to just talk about the legally recognized human being, as it were, right? Um, and I think those are connected because if there's a bit about, if there's a modernity to Hegel to which we really do want to hold on, I think, um, it's understanding our legal identity in terms of being a bearer of rights. Now, Hegel will immediately add, and therefore a subject of duties, right? But, uh, um, but the first part is essential, right? What I think he thinks is, um, the Roman understanding of the person was just one option, the civil social option, right? So like Marx sometimes thinks about Rome, Hegel thinks about Rome as sort of like proto capitalist Like if you're trying to imagine what the new market economy is gonna do in the next 50 years, you look to two places. You look to England, because you think they're a little ahead of us, and you look to Rome. Right, where anything can be owned, including people, including spouses, right? Um, and, but I think Hegel thinks that's just the civil social form of what it looks like to be a bearer of rights and a subject of duties or a subject of responsibilities. So there have to be, there has to be a corporate social version and there has to be a kind of bureaucratic version of it as well, I think that's right. Yeah. And then, you know, it gets, it gets really hard, like how, I mean, we continue to talk about equality before the law, right? That's really hard to actually spell out what that means, except in a kind of formal way that really nobody except maybe libertarians now believe really counts as equality before the law, right? Because that's the you know, the great line that the rich man and poor alike are forbidden to sleep under the bridge, right? Um, it just only matters to the poor man and not to the rich man, right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, so you see, for example, where um, he thinks, for example, the property rights for agricultural property ought to be fundamentally different from property rights to commercial and industrial property. Right, and in particular, for example, um, um, he thinks property rights for agriculture are very closely bound up with family because the principle of agricultural production is family. And thus the most important thing about agricultural property is that the farm remain big enough to support a family. And therefore he says agricultural property ought to be burdened with um, uh, primogeniture, right? That the farm passes undivided to the firstborn son. Hegel doesn't care about the firstborn son part of it, but he does care about the undivided part of it. Because at that time in Germany, farms were being divided and people were, um, 
becoming impoverished because they didn't have farms big enough to support them. And so manorial lords swept in and bought them all up, <laughs> right? So that's an example, I think, of, of the way person is supposed to be. Right. Sasha? You're running out of time, I don't know. I'll try and be. But I have a question about the morality, so. Ah, lovely. Okay. Oh, great. We have to talk about this. So I was thinking how to um, connect the two topics uh, from your talk. One is this topic of social pluralism, pluralism yes. and, that. and the beginning of your talk when you were speaking about this coexistence or synchronicity between pre-modern and modern. So uh, how, would it, how would it be to um, introduce the concept of multiplicity of times, of, of, of plural temporalities in the yes. sense that it's the response to this social problem. Yes. In the sense that, uh, uh, I mean, some social subjects we simply don't mean the same time order. Yeah, right. And I mean, this, but I mean, only if, 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 this, if we understand this point as in the sense that this plural temporalities or multiplicity of time is something that, that is internal to the, to the modernity. Yes. Right. So it's, uh, and I think with that, I mean, it's constitutive modernity. It's negative power, we could say, right. uh, in, in a way. And this sense, maybe uh, I, I, I would find this uh, Habermas concept of refeudalization yeah. of modernity as misleading. Yeah, because right, it, right, it right. presuppose the homogeneous time order right. in which we have the progress within, within modernity. Right. And the right or regress would be something that leads us outside of modernity. Right. But these feud feudal mom uh, moments are already present. So they are not something external to, right. to the modernity. Right, right. So if you recognize these plural temporal orders and plural social realities, now the question would be how to treat them. And the, what comes to my mind is the Marx. Uh -oh, and okay. how, for example, he discusses the uh -huh. Russian, Russian rural. What? Huh? The old fashioned Marx. Um, <laughs> no, actually, this Marx is not old fashioned. Yes. When he discusses the, the, um, the Russian uh, rural commune, Oxford, right. this primitive social organization right. with collective uh, property and collective modes of production, what he's saying is actually it's not to abolish right. them. Or, I mean, they're not, for Marx, they're not something external to capitalism or yes, production. Right. They're totally contemporary to them. And because of that reason, he sees in these archaic modes of production uh, the element of social regeneration. Mm -hmm. So that would be another way to, yeah. to treat this. Uh, I mean, OK, that's, maybe it's enough. I yeah. No, I, I mean, there's lots of resources in Marx. I, I was pretty negative, but uh, I took Luca to be offering me like a simple base superstructure. It's class all the way down. Um, there's lots of resources in the 18th Brumaire as well, right, where he's talking about, uh, I mean, um, you know, for whether the social revolution draws its poetry from the past or the future, right, and his, his talk about the small farmers and why they're so attracted to the Bonapartist myth so long. Um, and uh, for what it's worth, I do, I do agree, I, I don't want to use refutalization <coughs> as a general concept to describe what's going on. Um, I mean, only to indicate some things that are happening in the economy, but I think that's right. They're just feudal elements that maintain, right, uh, that, that uh, persist into uh, the capitalist mode of production that are in some sense essential to being part of it, right? This is part of the story you might think that um, historians are telling now about the role of slavery in the development of capitalism and so on, right? And the role of plantation life. Um, so, and I do think um, that it's probably constitutive of modernity and that that's more constitutive of modernity and an acceleration, right? It's the pulling apart of these temporal strata. Um, I have tried to deal with it in some ways. I'm not very happy with why I'm dealing with it. So one way I've tried to deal with it is to take up this notion from Francois Hartog of regimes of historicity to say essentially, look, you could say at one level of abstraction that however you want to chop it up. Like I want to chop it up, corporate society, civil society, and the state. 
um, have different kinds of temporality, right? So we can do things like um, uh, the agricultural estate is slow, it's inertial, it's basic references to the past. We could say that the civil social estate is accelerationist, its basic orientation is towards the future. But you could go one level deeper and think of each of these groups as having their own distinct version of the past, the present, and the future, right? Of each being a kind of Spannfeld. And I think that's the direction in which Hartog is going. I find his book extraordinarily suggestive, but I, I, it, it like escapes my grasp when I try and turn it into a theoretical resource. Um, but I do think that that's a, that, that's a deeper story. Um, and I, I don't know how to tell it yet. It's the God's honest truth. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Well, we have discussed for more than one hour. So <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it.